I wonder if we could start by talking about your mother's career as a whole. Mm -hmm. That, in in your view, did it have? I mean, obviously, it had two major sections. Mm -hmm. One was her acting career, mm -hmm. and then uh, she switched to directing mm -hmm. in the early sixties. Yeah, that's say. right. Yeah. Uh, did you, were there other subsections of her career that you can? I, point out no, I think it was divided very much into into those two parts. But the well, the acting should be divided between theatre. She did a lot of stage yes. uh, in the early fifties in London, okay. and the, the the films. So I mean, there were those two components. She was doing those simultaneously. Uh, she was doing a lot of it simultaneously. Yes, uh, she was under contract to the rank organisation for the films. Right. Uh, but she did a lot of stage work, and I remember Michael Mayer saying that he was very annoyed that she spent so much... Michael Mayer was a translator of Ibsen's work into English, I see. and he was uh, very annoyed that uh, she did so much film and less uh, stage acting, because she, he thought that she was very a very good uh, stage uh, actress and so on. Uh, did she enjoy stage more than film? Do you think? Um, that's difficult to say. I mean, you know, it's an early period of her career, so everything was moving very fast. But I think she um, she soon got quite frustrated with the acting in general. Her acting career, both in film and and theatre, is not being creative enough. I but I mean, she enjoyed doing the theatre. That's for sure. But. Um, Let's say that was particularly in the early 50s, early mid 50s. I mean, you say not creative enough. Uh... Well, she, uh, um, you have to learn your lines and you have to be on stage for, for weeks on end, and she found, she certainly found that frustrating, I Is think. Tedious? Yeah, tedious. Yeah, yeah. And she wanted to do something with more autonomy uh, and more creativity, which were, would have been directing. Do you remember when she first made this decision? Or? Yes, I remember it quite well. In the early 60s, she um, talking about it, saying that she really did want to do make this move, but she needed to get experience. So she decided she would do the uh, documentaries first. Uh, so she needed to know the technical stuff. She needed to know how to do things. And I remember the decision it must have been in the very early 60s, and I remember being discussed at home with David, David Hughes, um, uh, and uh, then negotiating with the BBC. Uh, uh, she had contacts there, and uh, eventually she, she managed to persuade them to, to, to let her direct these films. Well, you know them, of course. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Lords of Little Egypt, and yes. Gypsies, it's, yeah, in the Prosperity Race about uh, yeah. Sweden. Yeah, the Prosperity Race, uh, yes, and the Iceland film. And yeah. the Do It Yourself Democracy, democracy. exactly. The Polite Invasion. The Polite Lats. Oh, yes, and the Lats, yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, we found it interesting that we were unable to see the Prosperity Race in Sweden. Well, they were very upset about it. Were they? Yes. Well, it's, I mean, it's prob I haven't seen it, I mean, probably since the 60s. But it, uh, as some of her films are, it's quite critical in some ways of Swedish society. And that film was, and they, it wasn't uh, uh, taken well by in Sweden. We were I, surprised when we did see it at the BFI that, uh, it, that it was about uh, primarily Swedish youth games. Uh-huh. And it had a lot of, uh, had a sort of a commentary about youth and youth being bored and youth getting into trouble because mm. they... I can't it. remember it, uh, practically. Yes, of course. Yeah. Mm. But you were a teenager during this. I was a teenager and I appear very briefly in it, taking a shower, a uh, cold shower outside, l overlooking, uh, overlooking Stockholm. I, I mean, it's a five-second bit. I was persuaded to do this. Were you paid union scale? No, <laughs> no, no. I was grossly exploited, of course. And her, her first uh, short film, The War Games, yes. mm. that's another very interesting... That's very interesting. She was much involved in CND, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, in the early 60s, and she went on some of the marches and demonstrations. Um, so she was very much in favour of nuclear disarmament, and 
uh, identified quite strongly with the peace movement uh, in Europe at that time. We're talking now about the late 50s, early 60s, well, the early 60s. Uh, but she went on one of those marches, Aldermaston, which used to be the Easter marches, um, and uh, I was also went along. But uh, she, yeah, so she was uh, concerned about issues of of peace, war and peace, and that, that film is clearly about that. And that film was, was her, an effort on her part to, mm -hmm. to express that yeah. anti-war sentiment. Or yes, yes, well, that, the, the two boys, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. wonderful film. Mm. Yeah. And it, of course, was, got an award at Venice. Yes. Yes. yes we, we, we thought it was the golden lion, which is no. what the press clippings no. say, no. but apparently no. it was the silver. Silver, yes. And we certainly have seen press clippings, though. That's oh, silver. yeah, right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then uh, her first feature film, do you remember? Yes, the, the, uh, the Girls, I remember it very well. Was The Girls her first? Her first film, yes, uh, her first fe feature film. Um, that must have been in 1964, 63? Yeah, well, you would know that better than me. I haven't got it in my head. But um, they had a wonderful place in Lidinger outside Stockholm. Where, Lidinger, yeah. Yes. Mm. And yes, I remember that. I remember that film and also the uh, Night Games, the following one. Did you ever go on set? Yes, yes, several times, yes. Mm. And uh, can you describe any experiences? It's then? really difficult. Um, I don't think I have any particularly strong memories, but I, I, I went along. Um, it, I was curious to see uh, how things. I'd been also when she'd been filming in in the UK, uh, uh -huh. but as as an as actress, a uh, as a child, I used to find that excruciatingly boring because it was you know, one take after the other, and it wasn't very very interesting. But it was more interesting to see her in charge, and she was very much in charge. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and she did several feature films, one after the other. Yeah, yeah. The and girls, very Doctor Glass. And Doctor Glass. Loving couples. Lo uh, um, oh, sorry, I got the release. Really, so loving couples were the first, and f and the girls was the fourth. Yes. Yeah, right, loving couples. L loving couples was the first film of Flickwana. Sorry, yes. That's right. But they were all almost. Yeah. They were one after the other. Yeah. Quick yeah. I, that we're talking about um, nine, must have been 1964 to 68. Yeah. Something like that. Four or five years, uh, four films. So it was, yes, it was definitely. Loving Couples. Loving couples eh? El Skandapar. El Skandapar. Um, then it Night was uh, Nutleg, Night yeah. Games, Dr. Glass, Dr. and uh, Flickwana, the girls. Yeah, that's the order. Yeah. Mm. There's some uh, talk in her autobiography mm. that mm. Flickwana was not uh, as well accepted when it first came out as it was six or seven years later. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Actually, got a lot of criticism for for the films. I think in general, that's how she felt about it. I I didn't. I can't remember the reviews. But she, I mean, from Sweden, not elsewhere. Okay. She, she said, her, at least her perception was, or what she would talk about, would be that, that uh, the, um, in Sweden the films were not much liked or were more criticised and re regarded as being critical of Swedish society uh, around gender issues and as, uh, and as being hypocritical. And, and so on and so forth. Um, and so what she would express, particularly in relation to the girls, um, that uh, it was very badly accepted in Sweden, but not elsewhere. So I remember that. Yes, there's an interview on French television mm. in 77, I believe, where, mm. she, where she is happy that mm. the girls is finally uh, being better understood yes. than it was in 1968, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that it had received very bad reviews, including its technical aspects, which yeah. she said in the interview, yeah. are in fact quite good. Yes, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Well, that, yeah, that concurs with my, my exactly my impression. Uh, yeah, so, yes. so, so it wasn't understood, as, as she would say, in, in Sweden at all, and not liked. And then, uh, after those feature films, she went 
uh, back to doing documentaries. Mm -hmm. And why do you suppose that she did that? Well, I think partly, I think partly it was that she, Sandres or whoever it was, didn't want, uh, was not willing to provide her more space to do feature films. I think that's the case, uh, not 100%, but I know she had some frustrations about not getting some of the thing, not getting to do some of the things she wanted to do. Um, that was from the Swedish side. But of course, she she was living in France. Yeah, she went. That was a big change. They bought the place in 1966, and they moved there in really full time, 1969 or 1970. I th maybe a bit, bit earlier, but maybe 68, so 69. That yeah. coincided with uh, sort of backing off the feature films. Yes, moving it, to France. I don't. I mean, she still wanted to to do the feature films. I'm pretty sure about that. Um, but uh, I think she had some difficulties in Sweden, and very possibly related to the girls, which, as we said, was not well liked. I think that's an impression. I mean, it's a long time ago, and uh, right. but that's an impression. Yeah. Right. We wanted to ask you. Some personal questions, do you mm -hmm. mind? No, that's fine. It's okay. One of the things we're curious about is, uh, did it affect your life that your mother was in the public eye and to the extent that she was? And did it affect your life um, that the way in which she was in the public eye and that she more or less put herself and her own personage out? Um, in, in a somewhat causist way, I would yes. say, and, and yeah. um, how did that affect your life? Well, I think uh, when I was um, a child, I resented it, and, and it's in it's in her autobiography, um, because children tend to be rather conservative, and you just wanted normality, and uh, I had um, uh, unusual parents. Um, something that uh, was difficult for me, but I think uh, it's not totally unusual. I'm talking about even the 50s, so when I, when I was, you know, b between the age of five and, let's say, 11, and, you know, uh, she was very much in the public eye. And then we went to live in Hampshire, and I went to the local grammar school there. I had this hateful experience of lads asking me for her autograph and having to take the books back with me for the autographs, and I hated it. Um, and she understood that well. I mean, she under I was embarrassed, and uh, again, you wanted the normality, and clearly I wasn't. I was the only person of foreign origin in the school. For and you start. moved several times. Uh, well, we moved from London. I lived with my, from the age of... Five, six, so that's 1953, um, uh, and we lived in Kensington, very posh part of London, 1953 to 1959, and 1959 uh, she and David, well all of us, we went to live in Hampshire, a place called Petersfield, um, and so n there weren't that many moves, no, no, no. There were moves um, when I was very small, but I don't remember much about them. Uh, we have an odd question, mm -hmm. a pre-David Hughes question, mm -hmm. because it's just been driving us crazy mm. not to know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a research trip. Yes. Um, there, she wrote in her autobiography mm -hmm. about her trip to Hollywood yes. to um, do a couple of films. Yes. And uh, as she was writing about her attraction to Tyrone Power, yes. she said she was taking her time because mm -hmm. at the time uh, she was with a young American writer. Don Stewart. Oh, uh, now we know. Okay. Yeah, Don Stewart, yeah. He, he, they were sort of living together for three or four years. Probably. Yeah, we found out yeah. the name Don. But we yeah, Don that. Stewart. And his father had been an exile from the McCarthy period. Like uh, Carl Foreman in, in the Seven Oaks. 
Well, he was he was one of the people who was basically well decided and forced to leave. Donald Stewart Senior um, for communist uh, sympathies. Well, you know the whole story, but they were certainly left wing. Him and his partner Ella Winter, who certainly was a member of the Communist Party. Because I, I stayed there sometimes and been thrust a lot of propagandist uh, sort of comic, comics of, of uh, sort of uh, that kind of ideology. So they were certainly uh, on the left. Um, and um, Don, their son, uh, had a relationship with mine for three or four years. Tyrone Power was also, um, well, a partner of mine had a relationship with him, um, and he was about the Kensington House for some time, uh, you know, on, on some occasions with his daughters, Romina and the other one, I can't remember. Yes. Romina Power became a, an actress, quite famous. Um, and so, yes, they were around, certainly. Mm. I see, it. I see. It. No, certainly influenced uh, by my life. I mean, I, I mentioned about being resentful as a child, but when I was about, from about the age of 14, I thought it was great uh, having that environment because it's interesting. As you become an adolescent, there was a lot going on. There were a lot of interesting people going through the, through the house um, and lots of interesting conversations. So that there was quite a sharp shift. When, when I turned 13, 14, uh, life became very interesting being associated with Mai and David. And so that was fine then. And uh, I got a lot out of it. It was very interesting. There was, um, uh, there was a lot of discussion about politics, about um, theatre, about literature, about art. And that was very stimulating and undoubtedly influenced me and um, uh, my was of a left-wing disposition which uh, certainly must have influenced me because I'm there and still there um, so that, that would have been an element of it and, and also the uh, the peace movement I was very active in the peace movement in the here in the 80s and 90s um, and I went to the CND demonstrations when I was 13 or 14 14 probably 14 15 uh, the campaign for nu nuclear disarmament and so those opinions which were in our environment I sort of did take them on board uh, certainly and that would have been a, an influence. Right well we've, we've discussed uh, and we've asked uh, mm -hmm. people in the previous interviews mm -hmm. uh, about her politics mm -hmm. uh, and some of the responses are well she really wasn't a political person uh, but but you found that she had passions politically. Yeah, I mean, she had big concerns. Um, so uh, peace, war and peace was certainly a very big theme and much discussed. Uh, she wasn't political in the sense she wasn't interested in political parties. So she had no political affiliations. But her, her uh, options were clearly progressive, let's put it that way. And as you know, she was, as you probably have read, um, she was spied upon by oh, yes. MA, MI5. Yes. And it's certainly the case in the early 50s that a lot of the friends and uh, the environment, uh, um, her environment, a lot of the people were on the left. A left Labour, Communist Party, that's for sure. Um, and, um, and I remember some of them. Um, uh, even as a small lad, um, so that was definitely the case. But she was never; uh, she was very distant from any kind of commitment to any political party. She would never sign anything. No community uh, activism, uh, uh, organized politics. Yeah, yeah no organized politics, no party politics at all. But certainly progressive. Um, and would that apply also to her concerns about the condition of women? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that was uh, her, uh, her main theme in, in the major oh, fe uh, feature films. And it was always a, a big issue that was a uh, question that was talked about at, her, at home. So there was a lot of uh, talk about gender, 
well, the ter that term wasn't around then. In terms but, of power? Uh, in terms of power, in terms of asymmetrical relationships between men and women. Um, all of that was uh, certainly Yeah, there. she does appear yeah, to have yeah, made a, yeah. a very complete, detailed yeah. study of, mm -hmm. you know, in her own personal efforts mm -hmm. of this type of thing. But, uh, yeah. but it's hard to know from all the research we've done yeah. whether it was uh, deliberate or, uh, or not. Oh, or yes. De it's... No, certainly, certainly. It was very much part of her, I think, her two big issues, the things that she cared about were about um, the situation of women, uh, gender inequalities, um, and uh, war and peace. Those were her two issues. I don't think there's any question about that. She chose marginalized societies yes. and groups. And, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Like, for example, in, in Up Seals and Men, where she... Mm -hmm. uh, addresses the issue of the Inuit economy being yes. completely dependent on seal hunting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so it's always difficult to know when you see this treatment of the topic. Is she, is she lobbying to uh, n not change um, or lobbying to change? It's <laughs> I, I think um, in the early documentaries, I'm not sure about that one, but the early documentaries, I mean, she, I, I don't think that the intention was a lobbying intention. It was a, an attempt to have a different view of a particular phenomenon or a particular or society awareness. and from a more or less critical perspective, maybe. No, that may not be the case in the, the French film, but anyway, um, uh, the one in, in uh, the Camar. Uh. That's the big thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, she had a, she was, well, that's, I think, one of her talents. She had a good sense of synthesis. She would get her ideas over and... Um, and also when she would uh, when she would talk, she she was very opinionated and had a lot of causes, but she would really manage to get good compact statements. She and I think articulate. Yeah, she was articulate. Um, sometimes a bit insecure because she's self taught. She was self taught. She left school at thirteen. Um, oh, and and, and mm. three negotiating in three languages. Uh, yeah, in, yeah. In effect, yeah. You know, Swedish, English, and French. Not really French. Not so no, much French. No, no. no, she didn't she write really, French. That's no, true. no. And she, but she lived she, in France. She lived in France, but she never really uh, got a handle on French. Not at all. Uh, she had difficulties with French. Mm. Mm. But she wrote in both Swedish. Yes, and both English. Swedish we, and English. We yeah. Have, uh, experienced mm -hmm. that in the archives mm -hmm. and seemed to. Fluidly passed between. Yes, the two. no, she was completely bilingual, yes, totally yes, bilingual, absolutely. no question. Yeah. Uh, in *Bird of Passage*, uh, yes. one of her novels, mm -hmm. she has very rich descriptions of Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wondered if you had anything. Were you here when she was writing? Um, and I she visited Spain. Yeah, she visited us quite a lot. Yeah. And yeah. maybe. Uh, those yeah, I think she would have got some. Stuff. She would have got some from that. I can't remember the year of the publication of the book, though. Bird of Passage, seventy four. Oh well, then, then barely. That I came to live here in seventy five. I see. So then she must. But she'd have been, been here before. She'd been here, but not very much. Okay. I don't think. I mean, it was not far from where she lived in France. But I would say that she didn't come here. It was Until 1975. It was the book she wrote um, when she was splitting up with David Hughes. Oh well, then it's late. It's then. Then it's later. It's later. It's in the late 70s. 77. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's then, then she would have been here. She would have got her impressions. 76. But, yeah. 76. Because she came in 75 and 76 quite a bit. Because I, I, I was installed here. I'd got married and so on and. Um, so uh, she came here several times and visited. She loved she loved Barcelona, she? and she was very keen on the food, which is another of her passions, food. Uh, she talked a lot about food and cooked a lot of good food. 
Silly bird. Yes, she and good. grew uh, her own vegetables. Yes, she grew. She was passionate about gardening. And herbs. So that's another thing, another passion. Uh, she spent a lot of time uh, in the garden, a lot in Hampshire, and then in in um, Egvive and later in Le Mazel. She always had. She always devoted quite a bit of time to Egvive that. Egvive being Belvise. Uh, Belvise, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, Belvise, yeah, right. Yes. Did she learn this from her own childhood? No. Her love no, of gardening. I, no, I'm pretty sure not. She lived in an urban environment. And I don't remember uh, uh, her ever saying anything about allotments. There's a tradition in Sweden of allotments, but um, I don't remember anything about that. Although in Sweden there's a lot of culture with flowers and so on and so forth. In the spring, people, I remember very much as a child. In the, in the four-week growing season? Yes, it, yeah, but people were very interested in, yes. in, in flowers and it was a gift that you would give to people when you yes, went to visit... Um, and so on for a meal, it would often be a flower. But anyway, I, I'm, she will, I don't think it would have come from a, her ch a child, concrete childhood experience. Um, uh, when she came to England, um, I think that started there. How about your father? Was he a gardener as well? No, your, no, you know. no, no. So she became interested in gardening and pursued it? Yeah, pursued it radically and spent a lot of time doing it. Um, endless hours and uh, even some uh, conflicts uh, around the amount of money she spent on plants when she would go to one of the... Um, I've forgotten the name in English, you know, where you send plant a cell... Nurseries. Uh, gar uh, uh, nurseries and garden centres and David would... To not be happy about the amount of money that was spent. This is anecdotal, completely right, of course, of course. not uh, not of any great importance. But, yes. uh, but yeah, but she spent a lot of time doing that and cooked and cooked own. a lot. I mean, she was a very active person. So that um, if you, I mean, she was doing her professional thing. Uh, she would cook most of the meals and she would garden. Uh, so I mean, that's uh, quite a lot. Yes. And the children, me and my sister, would wash the dishes. Did you? <laughs> yes. yes. That sounds pretty normal. Yes, that was right. She didn't ever wash the dishes. Is that right? Yes. No washing up? No washing up. But she did a lot of other things around the house, a huge amount of things. So she was uh, a very busy, active person, not still at all. Was she uh, gone from home a lot? A lot, yes. Yes, quite a lot. Well, obviously, if she was filming on location or wherever, so yes, she was. She was spent long. A lot of those uh, Brank films were st in studio, though, right? Yeah, in studio. Yeah, so and she no, then she was in. Then no, in, in the London period, she was able to come home. Uh, yeah, it was only when she went to Hollywood, right. and then then that she was away. But otherwise, she was she was in London. She expresses a lot of guilt in her autobiography. Yes, no. about not being at home. And yes. But but um, from the notes and uh, the more extensive draft mm. of the autobiography that we've read now, uh, it, it seems that there there was a type of there was a normalcy to your family life yeah. more so than than one might think on mm. the surface yeah. if you just read the mm. autobiography. So yeah, no, she she was guilty. And she always expressed the guilt uh, quite openly. She felt. Guilty. She felt guilty. She mm -hmm. felt guilty. Maybe um, that's a generational thing. Uh, it might have Born been. Born in 1925. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, you know, she. I mean, she. When she was at home, she certainly was dedicated, and there was certainly family life. But of course, uh, because of the nature of her profession, there were times when she wasn't there. But she was also very explicit about not wanting to have children, and I think she says that somewhere in the biography. She, it was not her intention, and she certainly said, you know, well, as you know. Uh, to me, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, she felt very strongly that motherhood was not automatic uh, or uh, universal. And, and not women. her thing, and not something that she had particularly chosen to do. Um, and well, we talked quite a bit about it much later on, not when I was young. But uh, certainly uh, that feeling of guilt was there, and she would express it. But she felt particularly guilty about my sister, who had a lot of uh, personal problems, psychological problems, and 
lives in Sweden now on a pension and so on, and she felt especially guilty there in not being able to, not spending more time. Uh. You know, were you close or not? Yeah, yeah, no, we you certainly were, were. Yeah, 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 we were right. close. I mean, but, you know, it's it's a question of different phases. I mentioned when I was very young, uh, there was there were elements of res uh, resentment because of the public, uh, being a public figure, which I, I found very uncomfortable. So there was some resentment towards her. Uh, but we, I think we were close, certainly. Um, uh, and... Uh, also, probably when I, just before being an adolescent, I was a, a bit rebellious and uh, not very good academically, which was uh, uh, the kind of resistance that children do uh, unconsciously, um, because I was under a lot of pressure from mine, because she was self-taught, so, you know, she wanted a son who would be successful academically and so on and so forth, and... So what did I do? I played a lot of sport, which he hated. <laughs> and I was rather good at it. And so that was a period. So, you know, it's not, it's not, not homogeneous, but it evolves. Uh, but certainly we got on, I think, from, from when I was about the age of 14, 15, it was, um, began to be quite different, I think. Does yeah, that I, ring true to you? Yeah, I think that, that could be the case. Um, it's more intimate. Um, it, and the crews, of course, are much larger on the feature films. Yeah. Um, it's quite different. Um, and she had a, 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 a nice, fun group of people in the documentaries. I remember Chris Mengis, who was very young, who became a well-known director yes. later on. Uh, he, was, he was charming and fun for me as, a, as a, an adolescent or... A, I enjoyed him, and he was very kind and thoughtful, and uh, and, uh, and I think that yeah, they they were quite good crews, and they got on well. And then there was Edward, uh, who was the editor for later on, and they became good friends as well. Edward also visited France quite a bit. Also, she had to take the opportunities as they came, you know, she had, she had a professional life to lead. And uh, I think, I mean, things were very difficult economically for her at various periods, uh, particularly in Those the 80s. Those rank years didn't make her rich. No, it? no, no. She was not a good manager of her money, which she would certainly... Uh, and the money wasn't as big. In the it business. wasn't as big, but um, she... Um, uh, she would take the option of, uh, for instance, in uh, loving couples, uh, not loving couples, um, only two can play with Peter Sellers. Uh, she preferred not to take a percentage of the uh, royalties, but rather to have a lot of stuff in cash. Um, and that, that that was her choice, and so and and that went quickly. Where the movie would have been more successful. It, well, yeah, yeah, see, yeah, for her, yeah, it, yeah, it would have been more money. Yeah, yeah. Peter yeah. Sellers did the same thing, or yeah. similar. Uh, did he? he yeah, I did. Took yeah. a percentage and then he sold it prior to release. Oh right, okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> yes. So yeah. he too uh, uh, got burned on all yes, yeah. yeah. It was still uh, a marvelous film. Yeah, yes, yes, I remember that, I do remember it vaguely, yes. yes. So. But, yeah, talking about Maino, I think she was a very talented, uh, gifted person, um, and she was clearly a very good actress. I can't speak much about that, because I, 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 I saw her on stage, but I had no um, possibility of judging that. But I think, um, you know, she made a very serious attempt to make some films with, with messages and she was self-taught um, uh, so all that she did there I mean she had no training in film uh, she was trained in dramatis as an actress um, but before that she was in the circus and she was spotted by by someone and uh, well, but she had no formal education which would have allowed her normally to get into dramatis so I mean she had a lot of talent she was very gifted very strong-willed, um, and uh, you know, had an agenda of things she wanted to do, and I think, uh, I think she did it pretty well, and I think she has not had the recognition she deserved. That's my certainly my opinion.
Yeah, I mean, I think she had a complicated uh, teenage. Uh, she had... Uh, she was an only child. She was an only child. Uh, well, you know her story. Uh, you know the story. Uh, her father, Mr. Zettling, was not her biological father. Right. Um, uh, she also had another half-sister who was born by Linnea, her mother, also before Linnea was married. Is this the half-sister she discovered as Linnea's funeral? Very late in life she discovered... She talks about it in an uh, interview on Chinese yeah. television. Yeah. Um, strangely enough, I knew about that before she did. Really? I had a very good relationship with... Uh, my grandmother oh, Linnea, right. and uh, the same year she told me, but then the, then um, and it was difficult. She said not to tell my, um, and the, but that she would maybe do something about it. But it was her half sister who wrote to my, I think maybe on Linnea's instigation. Oh. Mm -hmm. anyway, there were lots of family secrets in that sense, and my didn't know that her. Her father, her, uh, her biological. Uh, uh, no, well, she didn't know about her biological father until she was thirteen, which is not a good moment in one's life to uh, be told that. I think it's a complicated. Also, a phenomenon of the times, perhaps. Uh, perhaps, but I mean, I think that w would be a particularly delicate and difficult moment, um, age thirteen or twelve. I'm not exactly sure, but that's how she, I think, told told me that. And that, and she she had a I think a rather conflictive r relationship with her mother. Oh, yeah. um, they didn't get on particularly well, partly because of that and of being told so late or whatever it was. I'm not really sure, but um, so I think she and she had boring jobs in in. She wo worked in a department store when she was thirteen. Uh, left school. Left right. school at 13 uh, with, uh, with, with... Her parents work. then, her stepfather and mother were not academics. Yeah, her... I think her mother wa was... Um, uh, had some mo more education, certainly. Um, she painted uh, um, and did a lot of paintings. Um, really? And always, um, and sold some of them. Um, uh, Mai didn't like the paintings, they're very traditional, slightly kitschy, I suppose, but uh, she uh, certainly had those uh, interests. Um, and she was, uh, she was a person who was, uh, had some knowledge of the arts, for sure, but um, uh, I think there was, a, there was the emigration to um, Australia for four years and they came back and that was not successful. Um, and uh, I mean, there were all kinds of tensions in, in her family environment, I think. Not that I know much about it, but that certainly was, was the impression that she would um, give to me talking about it later. Mm. She At all, not, at all. not at all. Well, she met Tutti in 1945. Tutti was an exile yes. from Norway and Jewish. That's a tragic story. Um, well, that's a terrible story. Yes. Um, and uh, so that's, I think, the way the war impinged on her. Um, was uh, her relationship with him and his... Is that what you mean? Yeah, uh, well, uh, well, he was an exile, yeah. um, and so that, that brought the war directly to her, and then the, the, the family tragedy... Uh, that was lived through in the 1944 and 45. Right. Uh, right. And was, she, yeah. But but the the cultural difference of uh, your father, your biological father, being mm. of Jewish heritage and, mm. and she not being of Jew. I mean, there was no conflict there. There was, uh, there was some. Yes. Okay. Um, um, my grandmother Linnea was not totally happy about it. I see. There was some Jewish background in the family, the Swedish family, oh. which was never talked about. Um, the family name, uh, Turnblum, that mm. was not the real family name. The real name was Khar, K-H-A-R. Uh -huh. And uh, they, again, that was something I heard from Linnea a year before she died. Family secret, nobody knew about it. Um, uh, uh, 
there used to be all kinds of exotic stories about because Linnea did not look one tiny bit classical Swedish um, uh, and uh, so the story, well, descendants from the royal family, no, no, it was not. And I used to say, well, you know, my, this is a ridiculous story. You, probably your grandparents were from southern Europe, um, from Yugoslavia or somewhere. And I think the car, K-H-A-R, came from the fact that it came from Kharkiv in the Ukraine. Uh-huh. Okay, so anyway, that's, that can be checked up in, in the records. I've never bothered to do it. But she told me, well, this is how the name was spelled, K-H-A-R. And, of course, they were not Swedish. So Linnea's uh, parents or grandparents mm. had emigrated yes. to Sweden. Yeah, yes, yeah. Mm. On one side, uh, right. I think, I think, but uh, um, it's all rather obscure right. and complicated. Right. But anyway, they were not of Swedish origin, and they took a very Swedish name, Turnblom. Yes, but sure. Uh, and uh, but that wasn't the, the that was not it was by depot they changed the name. Right. From Car K A J R. Right, of course. Mm. Um, mm. So you were not brought up in the Jewish no, tradition. No, no, not at all. Your father no. wasn't. Well, he, yeah, he was uh, certainly the family. His father, my grandfather, was uh, more or less practicing. Um, but uh, uh, there was some issue uh, about um, my converting. She refused to convert to Judaism because they wanted me to be uh, as... Bar mitzvah. Uh, bar, well, no, no, before that. Um, right. Well, I was circumcised, but... Um, uh, they wanted it done, you know, with a rabbi, and, and my refused um, uh, on that front. So anyway, there was, a little there, there was some conflict. There was some conflict, yeah. But my was fascinated, and I think interested by the cosmopolitan thing. Uh, Tutti was a ballet dancer, classical ballet dancer. The rest, the other brothers, were also in th- in and around theatre and music. And uh, I think that she found that very fascinating and I think she always had a lot um, later on, a lot of Jewish friends uh, Uh um, and I think uh, so she found it interesting I think Hmm. Right There was no religion at home at all, that should be said Yes, Uh, I would say So my was um, uh, when I was young uh, atheist, um, um, not I- at all in sympathy with organised religion, but later on in life she had a lot of affinity with Buddhism, if, um, and she got quite involved in that. But um, certainly when I was young, there was absolutely no um, no yeah. religion at all. Yeah. Uh, you accused her in your 1979 uh, interview for the autobiography of being overly impressed by scientists and doctors. <laughs> yes. Well, I one of them for heaven's sake. But yeah, yeah, she was. I think she. Well, that, but it's partly to do with her insecurity uh, and her leaving school at the age of thirteen. So intellectual insecurity. Yeah, inter- intellectual, and so so she would. Well, but also, yeah, I think that's true. She was overly awed, perhaps. She wanted yeah. you to be a scientist or a doctor. Yeah, certainly, yeah. certainly. And look where I ended up. Um, well, you're a scientist of sorts. Sorts of scientists. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm a scientist of sorts. That's right. And but um, you, you, you're a social scientist. Well, right? I've got a very Is odd but academic it? background. I did sociology, but then I went on and did. A uh, degree in well, basically ecology, environmental science, and so is science. and then Absolutely. I did two years uh, undergraduate degree in life science, which I didn't finish, and a degree in geography, which includes both social and physical yeah. science. Uh, so it's a mixture. So you made her proud for sure. Yeah, she career. was very proud, I think, and she was very pleased. But uh, an anecdote which I do explain sometimes to people, you know, how much uh, parents and family environment influences. When I was a lad, although I wasn't very good academically, I was called the professor. Really? Even from the age of six or seven. It's slightly worrying that that's what I am and what I ended up being. 
So, but I was not because I was reading lots of books about astronomy and devolution and things like that. So you're precocious as a child. I wasn't precocious. No, I don't think so. Maybe when I was very young, but not not particularly. I was not especially. You just, your nose was in a book. Uh, my nose was in the book when I was very young, and then there was a period when I resisted it. But the nickname that I had was a professor because I was into books. But and um, uh, and the French period, and when I was at the Lycée Français de Londres, and um, also because I was absent-minded, <laughs> which I still am. And she spent a lot of time lobbying for that, and it was it was a, a film, a project which was very close to her heart. She really, I she book. was very, very, My very Swedish friends have all read um, it keen on it, and she really wanted to do it. There were there were some other projects which didn't um, she wanted to do. She, I um, introduced her to Ursula Le Guin. Oh, yeah. um, left Hand of Darkness. Because you had what, a science fiction interest. Yes, in yes, and I've written a little bit about, about it, not serious, academically seriously, but... Well, I've just done one publication recently, but... Um, and she wanted to get the rights to that, but Ursula Le Guin said that she didn't want the film to... It, it, she didn't want it made into a film, and that was a disappointment for her, I remember, because she was really uh, interested in that, that work, The Left Hand of Darkness. Mm. But uh, but the, the 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 last project was, uh, I think the last project the woman who worked at the I can't remember the, woman the, who the, the, the world. world yeah and that <laughs> was, that was she was very translated yeah. a report from mm. a scrub bucket yeah, ah right but she was very very keen on that that was something she she really wanted to do I think of all the projects that I can remember it was certainly one of the things that she uh, was most committed to and she's worked very hard on trying to, to get it done. Mm. Um, what about her children's book? Work? Yes, the, the cat... Cat's Tale. Was cat's it? Tale, yes, the Cat's Tale. <laughs> written with uh, David Hughes, yes. And there was one called Crystal Palace or the Ice Palace or something? Yes, I don't remember that one so well. I remember the Cat's Tale because that... I'm, again, I don't remember. That must have been written in the late sixties. Yeah, very early, and it was to do with uh, it. It had its origins in in domestic and household things, and the fact that we had cats and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, so I remember that book, uh -huh. but not the others really. Did mm. she do those because she just? Wanted to, or was commissioned to do them, or how? You... No, I, I don't, I don't think she was commissioned to do them. But I think, uh, I, I think there was a lot of entertaining talk about um, cats and uh, this and that at home, and then she wanted to Explain. do something with David. Uh, but I, I don't really have a clear idea of its origins. And cheese, one of the there was something. The moon is uh, um, one of the favourite topics of discussion uh, in terms of food. A term was cheese. <laughs> I still have a passion for cheese. I have not lost it. And there was, there was a lot of cheese talk. Well, it's normal in. in no, but this was in England. In England, in England Good when there was in, in the sixties, can you imagine? There was very little uh, available. Oh, yeah, they used to make expeditions to this shop, which I can remember, in London called Paxton and Whitfields, which was one of the few places which had a very large section of cheeses, um, not only English. Anything else you'd like to offer about your... Well, I, I mean, I personally think it's great that you're doing this. Um, so I'm always uh, very happy to collaborate in any way possible. As I stated, I, I think that she deserves the recognition. Yeah. Which she's getting now, well, uh, later. Is, yeah, um, this is the thing. It's not so much even <laughs> that she's getting more now. It's as, if, it's as if she's kind of timeless. Yeah, yeah. It's as if, you know, her ideas are, are timeless mm. in a way, mm. in that uh, uh, 
you know, she just keeps cropping up. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. She keeps cropping up and people can't. And there's always resistance. Yeah, yeah. Because that, that was part and parcel of her work, was yeah, the resistance. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's true. I mean, she was a, a innovator. I mean, she was making these films in the 60s on firsts. gender and women. Um, uh, and although there was a women's liberation movement which was developing in the mid-late 60s, I um, mean, she was doing this quite parallel and independent from using uh, some works of fiction as a basis of that, but in The Loving Couples... Um, and so on, and uh, you know, I think she did a, a remarkable job, really. Yes. Um, so it's good that there's that recognition is there, and uh, that the academics, me being an academic, I'm uh, pleased that also academia is showing an interest, and there's the odd PhD thesis coming out here and there, and you know, I get written to by people from time to time. And, and I think it is uh, certainly well well deserved. I mean, you, given, especially, I mean, even if she hadn't had the, the difficult background she had in terms of education, I think uh, you know, you you could set that aside and say it, it's it it's it standalone. You know, the stuff is is interesting and remarkable, and I think she, I think she's a very highly in, intelligent, uh, very intelligent person who had. A lot of insecurities because of her lack of her, uh, uh, you know, formal education. But uh, you know, I think she she had a lot to say, and she was very opinionated and had a lot of courses. And versatile. Yeah, these yeah, works yeah, are yeah, all quite yeah. different from one another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, in the, mm -hmm. a lot of the press, yeah. which she seems to have saved every single press clipping ever yeah. written, yeah. which is you know a whole. Uh, Segment of mm. research we didn't really have time. Yeah, to read. Mm -hmm. but you know, there's always this attempt with artists to pigeonhole them mm -hmm. and say, "Oh, she's a woman's filmmaker." Yeah, or she, mm -hmm. but you know, you look at a movie like Doctor Glass. Yes, yes, that's definitely you know, that's different. different yeah. or, or she's she works with ensemble casts. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. not in Doctor Glass. Yeah, it's all. Yeah. She can do a lot of different yeah. types mm. of work mm. expertly. I, mm. It's mm. you know this is this is mm. not a common yeah. thing. So she, you know she's she was really quite the artist. Yeah. I think so. I think that's the truth. And she resented being pigeonholed as being either a feminist or a women's liberation thing because she she was doing it from her artistic perspective. I mean, she was very concerned about the, 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 the issues that the women's movement uh, were, were raising, but I think it was quite independent. Yeah. Uh, certainly, because it, she has uh, quite a lot of the literature, um, women's literature, but that's actually later. Mm -hmm. It's later. If you look at, at what she had uh, at home, I've got some of the stuff, I took some of the books with me. There are things published after those fe feature films. Or their thing, or I mean, okay, she she would have Simone de Beauvoir, and she would have uh, um, things written earlier. But um, if you look at what she had uh, in her collection, uh, it was the stuff that was published later, or that she uh, that may have been published earlier, but she bought later in the seventies or eighties. Mm -hmm. It so wasn't she... there in in the library in in Hampshire. I think, I mean, she was thinking about these things for a long time before she actually started the the uh, film, The uh, Loving Couples, um, and all these issues, and they were talked about at home, so there was discussion there. But, um, as I say, she was not sort of linked in with what was happening politically. It was a complicated time, the, the, the mid-late 60s. I was, I was... Uh, a radical student of 1968, and I was very much of that generation, she watched it with interest and asked me things about it, but she wasn't doing, I would say she wasn't doing the reading about it. She was, it was, she was quite independent, but of course these are contextual things, and of course there is always some kind of overlap. You will, it, will, it will have influenced her in some way, but I don't think she was reading, I mean, she was doing her own interpretation of some of... Uh, uh, you know, what she thought was going on in Swedish society, 
when the time that, that uh, loving couples is is set and so on and so forth. And she was very she was very critical of uh, Swedish society in terms of gender relations. She said that the Swe uh, she would often say that Sweden. Um, uh, uh, while formal rights were established very early, the actual inter interactions between men and women hadn't changed as much as uh, people would like to make out. She, that would be a comment that she would make quite frequently. Mm. So that, you know, the, 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 the formal equality is there, but then there's the other more cultural aspect of, of gender relations which uh, and power and so forth, uh, which uh, it takes a lot, lot longer to move. And that would be something she, she certainly... So, uh, what about uh, we, something that we weren't aware of uh, until we started interviewing people and, and looking at some of the archives, she, she, she seemed to have somewhat of an interest in the paranormal. Yes, she did. She did. Can you describe a few of those? Yes, um, she did. That was a thing of the, which emerged in the 60s. Um, she was interested and she read a lot of stuff and she got interested in sort of astrological things and so we had differences of opinion on this. Um, but because you weren't. I wasn't, but I was interested. In, there was a lot of Ouija board things and, and she would go into a trance. As far back as Ingle uh, Landry. She was yeah, and she was Ouija doing board. that and Ouija board and some of the things that came out were hilariously funny, very interesting. Um, and about, uh, you know, you'd ask questions and she was in the trance and it would move and you, the other people would take their hands off. And, and she'd then, go into a trance. Yeah, she was in a trance-like state. And there were some funny things said about people, um, very funny things. And I, um, uh, I, I remember one session, I didn't know where I was going to go to university, of course it's a very personal thing. And uh, so I, I asked, I asked, well, where am I going to go to university? And, and it said, gonorrhea ridden bard's frontier land. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a place I was going to end up in. <laughs> Which may have been true, uh, where I went, but I don't know. But that was quite funny. So there were, the, she was interested in that. She was, uh, Madame Blavatsky and all these kinds of things. She would be reading. She was interested in Nostradamus and mm -hmm. uh, so on and so forth. And I think that sort of paranormal thing was something the well, yeah, earlier. But what I remember of it, it wasn't present in in my youth in the fifties for sure. But in Hampshire, yes, in the sixties, and uh, that was going on. And so she was interested in that, yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm. Very interesting. <laughs> but I don't, and then later, I would say not so much. Later. I think, I, th I, I can't be sure. You said she developed an interest in Buddhism. Buddhism, yes, certainly. Is this through Sheila, or who's a mm, Buddhist? Yes, you or? know, this, um, not because of Sheila, I think independently. Um, in the late 80s, early 90s, yeah, and when she was uh, terminally ill, she was much connected with that. Um, when you say Buddhism, was she into the I Ching or the well, Taoist? Kind of uh, I Ching, well, no, I mean, I don't really know much about it. We found it. something that looked like yarrow sticks. Yes, yes, she did. I've got her copy of the I Ching. You her, do? Yeah. I couldn't find it. And Sheila <clears throat> meditated, of course, because yes. she said, and she said, "My did not have the patience for meditation, but maybe mm -hmm. later in life she did." Yeah, no, I think this is probably true. Yeah. Uh, she was very active. I mean, she was always busy doing things, and so you know, you need to take time out for the, that kind of activity. And so I think that's probably fair uh, point. Um, so I don't remember my. Meditating, I don't remember her doing that ever. But she had an interest. But she had an interest, yeah, she had an interest in the ideas and so yeah, on. Yeah.